Do online meetings make you sleepy, grumpy, cause headaches or nausea? You may be suffering from Zoom fatigue. The medicine you need is J Man Speaks. Let's go! This is Jeremiah's J Man Manero with J Man Speak. J Man to the rescue! There's no sleeping in this room. Edutainment. High energy. Yahoo! Wake up. Wake up. Your head's gonna explode. Ooh. Yeah! Ah! Refreshingly authentic. Test, test. Come with me if you want to live. Side effects will include extreme joy or euphoria, enhanced learning, increased energy and motivation, and feelings of invincibility. Good morning, good morning, good morning, and happy Friday. Welcome to 18 Fridays, everybody. Ask the experts anything meaningful Friday. Uh, <clears throat> hold on, let me just change this light. All right, I'm back. Uh, I have my special shirt on today. I call this my multiple offers shirt. If you can't see it, it says, if you're not first, you're last. Shake and bake, baby. We're talking about multiple offers today, so please... Uh, if you're watching this live, first tell us where you're from. We've got a couple people watching. Uh, but also tell us what you'd like to know when it comes to multiple offers. We have a couple things that we're going to talk about. Obviously, we have kind of an agenda, but we would like to address things specifically if you have something that you'd like to talk about in regards to multiple offers. So I'll wait and I'll give you guys a round of applause. Okay, so if you're not first, you're last, multiple offers, and I understand that multiple offers are handled uh, in so many different ways. I, I guess we're going to be addressing it today from a buyer's agent perspective. Uh, a little bit about me. If you don't know, I'm international speaker of the universe, but I'm also an ABR uh, instructor, accredited buyer representative. So if you have never taken this class, uh, not this class, but the ABR class designation, it's definitely worth taking. I highly recommend it, not just because I'm an instructor, but hey, uh, if you're trying to write offers and get them accepted in a seller's market, an extremely hot seller's market, I think as as we uh, as we talk to people from all over the country and the world for that matter, I think uh, it's a seller's market. So let's start talking from a first come first serve perspective. If you are in a market where you list a property and then as soon as that property is listed, first person to get in there, writes an offer, gets it accepted, you're in. So in that kind of a market, you do have to be at the top of your game, right? You have to go in, you have to have that conversation ahead of time uh, with the buyers that you're working with and say, look at this kind of a market, you may need to leave work or we need to do virtual showings where I can video you in on something that's you know, hits the market at nine o'clock, if you can't get out of work till five, it may not be there, right? Depending on, on the market and how you handle uh, the approval of contracts. Uh, that being said, you then also have to have a discussion with the buyer uh, and educate them on the market reality saying, okay, uh, I like to use RPR, the realtor property resource. And I would say, here's what the market's doing. I'm gonna get my market report. So we did our market report video not too long ago. And uh, statistics, you, you can never dispute this st statistics and it really helps when your client's parents may be trying to tell them about the market when they haven't purchased a home in 30 or 40 years. Hey Jeffrey, how you doing today? So if in, in our market, you know, I could say just year over year, our market's been up 10.8%. But I know that our list price to sale price ratio, meaning, you know, what it's listed for and what it sells for is 101, yeah, 101.3%, which means, no, 101.6, here it is, 101.6%. So use the data to educate your buyers and say, look at, in our market, in this area, the average 
The average across the board is 101.6, which means if a property is listed for 200,000, okay, and this this will be a better number for you if you're in a $500,000 market. Let's say 500,000. If a property is listed for 500,000, that's 3 6 that's it'll probably sell for 507 5000 on average almost $10,000 over asking okay when you use percentages like that make the numbers real so that they can understand like hey if you see a property and you like it it's not abnormal to go over asking if if you don't allow them to be educated on that then they're going to be surprised so our inventory year over year we're down uh it depends on the area, but we're down 40, 42%. Yeah, houses for sale. Um, median sale price, inventory. Yeah, our month supply of inventory is 0.8 in our market, okay? Uh, let me get the... Yeah, 43.7% uh, inventory of homes for sale. That's year over year. Now, if I showed you the graph, it's steadily declined. So 19 to 18, it was 13.2. Uh, 18 to 17, it was 10.8. And then 17 to 16, it was 16.6. So we've been on a steady decline of inventory of homes for sale. So you got to educate them. In the beginning, when you're doing that buyer presentation and you're talking to them, how's the market? Here's what you need to expect. You know, And, and I might even have the conversation like, look at we're probably going to write a dozen offers before we get one accepted. You say a dozen offers. Yeah. A dozen, like 12 to in their mind. They're going, okay, it's a numbers game, right? Maybe your average, you're, you're a really good buyer's rep and maybe your average is six. Ours is probably five or six, right? I'd rather tell them a dozen. And then if it takes three, then you're exceeding expectations, right? That's how you, you perform better that way rather than saying, you know what? I am the best buyer's agent that ever lived. I'm going to get you that house. And then the first house for reasons that are outside your control, the offer doesn't get accepted. You're going to get fired. Okay. So let them know, uh, educate them on the market first. Second, you have to look at their situation or their circumstances. If I was working with a buyer and they had a grant program and they needed concessions, and, 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 and I'd have to say, okay, where can we sharpen our pencil a little bit? Okay. What I mean by that is, okay, if we need concessions to purchase a home, which means the seller's giving money back to the buyer towards their closing costs. If we need concessions, is there a way that maybe you could get that as a gift from a relative, from your parents, from anybody for that matter? Is there, let's explore that option. Okay, rather than asking for concessions in a market like this, I could almost guarantee uh, that that's not going to get accepted. Are they getting a grant? Okay, let's look at the grant program. Let's look at the program and see what's really required of the program. Because a lot of times they're like, you need to put this contingency in and you need to put that contingency in. You need to put this contingency in. That's fine. I'll put them all in, but we're never going to we're never going to get the house. Okay, because there's times where they say. Uh, it has to be contingent on the buyer receiving uh, grant money to close, whatever. I don't know. I'm, that's not the exact exact verbiage, but I've had discussions with with where they were getting the grant from and say, hey, could I just because there's a mortgage contingency in there, right? If they don't get the grant money, they don't get the mortgage. Correct? Yes. Okay. Can I just leave it as the mortgage contingency and not add these additional? Uh, contingencies that you're asking for? The answer was yes. Okay. If you don't know, you don't ask. You have to explore every option. Now, the the other thing that you could say is, uh, you know, I have a buyer, if you haven't heard of NACA, N-A-C-A, they're, they're uh, National Affordability Corporation of America, something like that. They're a not-for-profit whose goal is to just help people buy homes uh, as affordable as possible. They have a no down payment, no closing costs. Great program. However, they do require an inspection. Uh, once that inspection is done, they have what's called a hands team that looks over the inspection and makes recommendations. People, the, the popular misconception is that people think that those recommendations are required repairs, and they're not. 
with that kind of a uh, mortgage, with that kind of a program, they could actually roll those repairs in just like a 203k, but even more streamlined. So in that scenario, I can say, okay, the buyer's going to do a home inspection, but we're not putting that in as a contingency. If anything comes up, you know, this is, it's a for their own information inspection. Anything does come up, they're just going to roll it into the mortgage. Make sense? Okay. Cause sometimes I don't recommend you, you're waiving inspections. You know, that there is a lot of liability there. Uh, but if you need to, if your market's like that, and ultimately your duty is to obey the buyer, right? And if the buyer wants you to waive that inspection, then you should have a waiver of liability saying, you know, we don't recommend that you do this, but please know that by doing this, we're not at fault. Okay. Uh, maybe they're, you know, maybe they're a contractor, they're a construction person. Uh, the other option is we have local inspectors and if you don't have any, I mean, everybody has local inspectors, but we have local inspectors who are doing walk through home inspections, which means I like this house. We're going to go back for a second showing. They bring, uh, they call the inspector, say ring, ring, ring. Hey, we're going to go check out this house. We'd like to do a walk through home inspection. So if a normal home inspection might be three, 350, $450, depending on your market, then a walk through home inspection, which takes 20 minutes would be like a hundred to 150 bucks. Okay. It helps the buyers to say, okay, I'm willing to waive my inspection because I had an engineer come with me, not Uncle Joe, who's like, oh, uh, that's a problem. No, a real engineer or a home inspector come with them at a reduced rate, look over the house for 20 to 30 minutes, and look for look at things that might be of concern to the buyer or just give it a general, you know, once once over. Check out the roof, check out the mechanics, you know, crawl spaces, that kind of stuff. 30 minutes or less so that they can feel a little bit more comfortable in waiving their inspection, Okay. Now, in our market, we use something called uh, delayed negotiations. Okay, that's, I first talked about first, first come, first serve. Now I'm talking about delayed negotiations. Uh, REOs or bank owned properties have been using this for years where they, uh, they would do a simultaneous period, they called it, right? So regardless of whether I write an offer on the first day, the second day, or the last day, whenever that, that simultaneous period is, the offers come, are coming in simultaneously at the same time. So in our market, we do this delayed negotiations. It has to be decided when the person takes the listing. It's not something they can do on the fly. So they, they say, okay, delayed negotiations. Uh, let's say I list this house today's Friday. I might list it, put it in the system today, and say we're going to do delayed negotiations until Monday at 6 p.m. Okay, that gives enough time for people to see the property, especially with COVID. We can't have overlapping showings. Back in the day, we could just stack 30 people at a time, like, yo, go through there, let's see the offers. Now we can't do that. You know, we stagger them 30 minutes at a time, give enough time for people to get through. And then we say, okay, Monday at 6 p.m., we're gonna review all of those offers. Similar to what you may have seen, like a highest and best kind of a scenario, but it's already decided when the listing goes in. Right, so that even if I got in there in the first 10 minutes that it's on the market, you can't take my offer over anybody else's offer until the delayed negotiations period ends. So there's a couple of different strategies for that, right? That's, you know, sometimes, hey, being the first one, you're top of mind, you come in with a great offer, that can bode well for you when they're evaluating the offers. Some people like to wait until the very last minute, like it's eBay. Right? You might say, oh, there's only one offer. And then the last day, oh, this last morning of the last day, a second offer comes in. Then the last hour of the last day, five offers come in. Okay, and then you're like, damn, what am I, what am I gonna do now? Uh, and so it's, it's a little crazy. But there's, there's, a lot, it, it's, there's a lot of strategies there. Now, if I had a buyer who had written multiple offers and they were like, oh, I don't wanna compete at this point. There are times where there is delayed negotiations and no offers come in. So they got egg on their face, right? It's not as often, but it does happen every once in a while. So the buyers will say, okay, let's just wait and see what happens till after that delayed negotiations deadline. So that Monday at six, uh, I could call in, I called the agent Tuesday morning and say, Hey, did you guys get any offers on that property? Uh, and I'm hoping like this, like, no, say no, say no, say no, say no. They say no. Fine. Now I'm going to write an offer. 
I'm going to give it a short uh, expiration period because I don't have any any competition. Okay. But keep in mind, it's like writing the very best offer. With that deadline, it's just like highest and best, right? When uh, for years we used to do, thanks, Jeff. For years we used to, you know, th there's a lot of things that are customary in the market, in your market, but it's not law. It's not code of ethics violation. Uh, it, you know, it's just what you usually do in your market. So let's let's play that out. I have a listing. You write an offer on it. Okay, offer comes in. Hour later, another offer comes in. Now, it is customary in most markets for you to say, you know, Jeff writes an offer on my listing. Hey, Jeff, uh, we just had a second offer come in. What we're going to do is ask for the highest and best offer uh, by tomorrow at 6 p.m. If you want to keep your offer the same, that's fine. Just let us know. All right, so you're being treating all parties fairly and ethic ethically. However, the flip side of that is I could just say, I could not say anything and just say, oh, sorry, Jeff, we didn't take your offer. We had another offer come in that we accepted. And Jeff's going to go, what? I can't believe that. I would have come up, well, it's, I, I give the, the different scenarios to my seller and then I let them decide. It's not up to me, right? Because uh, sometimes when you inform all parties of multiple offers that can also not go in your favor, right? More times than not, economics, right? Supply and demand people are, especially in this market, they want it, the price is gonna go up. Uh, I could tell you when I, probably my first month in the business, uh, we had, I had this property, multiple offers come in. I'm like, yeah, I'm killing this business. I'm so good at real estate. I call all the agents and I'm like, hey, we have multiple offers just to let you know. We're going to take highest and best. I call the next one. Yeah, we got multiple offers just so you know we're going to take highest and best. Then I call the third one. Yeah, just so you know we're going to take multiple offers, you know, highest and best. They all said to me, oh, I'm sorry, the buyer doesn't want to compete. They retracted their offers. So I went from hero to zero in three phone calls. And that taught me. That's only going to happen to me one time. Uh, you have that conversation with the seller and say, hey, we could let everybody know that there is multiple offers. More times than not, it drives up the price. Uh, but we do run the risk of people just saying they don't want to be in competition. Now, I understand some of you, the, the, the seller's markets, that's not probably not going to happen because you have so many offers. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, so the other thing that you can do if you had buyers that weren't interested in competing, I'm just kind of jumping all over the place here. Uh, but if you had buyers that weren't interested in competing, do a search in your MLS, have a search set up for properties that have been on the market for greater than 10 days, right? Typically a property, will, if it's going to have multiple offers, it'll be in that, that first 10 days on the market. So search for ones that have been on, you know, I wrote an offer this past week on a property that was on the market for 83 days. And what had happened was they accepted an offer, an all cash offer, multiple offers scenario. That deal fell through. The other offers they had at the time went and bought something else. So now it was just sitting on the market. We wrote an offer below asking, got it accepted. Probably the first one we didn't have competition on in quite a while. But you have to be diligent in the market. Don't just look for new listings. Look for old ones as well. And and let your buyers know, like, look at I know you wanted something turnkey, but maybe this one that has a tired uh, kitchen or this one that needs some flooring or this one, you know, compromise somewhere so that we can get you a property uh, within your within your price range. Okay. All right. Yeah, I know it's crazy, right, Jeff? So let me, I'm going to bring in something here. I got some, because the next thing I want to talk about is an escalation clause. Uh, so if you've never taken the ABR class, we, we do talk about this a lot. But an escalation clause means, hey, if another offer comes in, I'm going to escalate my offer to X amount over the best offer. So I have a visual. Let me see if I got it over here. Over here. Here we go. Boom. Covers my whole face. Let me lower this for a second. Okay, go over here, and then I'll move this way. All right, so if looking over, I'm looking over this way. With the escalation clause, 
Um, these are three different ways that it can be written, but basically what you're saying is if another offer comes in or whatever other offers there are, we are willing to go over the highest offer by X amount. So this is three ways that it's written. Here's the, and this is really three ways that it was written on a property. Not my personal buyer. It's not, I'm not violating any kind of confidentiality. So escalation clause. Buyer's offer will be 2000 over highest bona fide offer. So the word bona fide means verifiable, right? We can, we can verify that. And that could be re the redacted for us. Uh, and again, I understand you may not write your own contracts. We do in our market. But if you're writing an offer to purchase, I would just say the redacted first page or redacted email or redact, redact whatever it is as proof of the other offer. That's easy enough, okay? Now you notice in the, the one that's highlighted, I'm not saying 2,000 over the highest bona fide offer with a max amount of 500,000, okay? Because if I did that, I would be violating my fiduciary duty of confidentiality, right? You get that? Because my buyer is saying to me, hey, we're willing to pay up to 500000 That's confidential. If I say that to the, to the seller's agent, I'm violating my fiduciary duty of confidentiality unless the buyer gives me permission. Okay? If they give me permission, then that's okay, but here's what, where you run the risk. Let's just say I'm using 500 again for a round number. Uh, that listing's for 450. You say we're going to go maybe 5,000 is a better number when you get up into those price ranges. Because you also have to think the other offer could be cash if yours has financing. Those are all things to, to kind of think about. But uh, so it's 450,000. I write in there, we're going to go 5,000 over the highest bona fide offer with a cap of 500,000. A savvy listing agent like myself is going to look at that and go, okay, so you're telling me you're going to pay 500,000. All right, see what else comes in. Maybe the, the best offer is 455, which means yours would be 460 if I'm exercising the escalation clause. Now, I work for the seller. I can then come back to you and say, hey, uh, Jane Doe, uh, we're going to counter your offer for $500,000. And you're going to go, well, if you're going to use the escalation clause, we need verifiable proof of the other offer and how much it is. No, no, I'm sorry, Jane. Uh, maybe you misheard me. What I'm saying is we're going to counter your offer for 500000 I know that your buyer is willing to pay 500000 because that's the cap that they put in the escalation clause. If I could drop this mic right now, that, that's, I would drop it. Here, I dropped it. Whoop, whoop. I dropped it down. You get it? You get it? You see why how dangerous that is? And, and maybe you don't care. Maybe the buyer doesn't care. They don't care. Hey, I don't care what I pay for this. I just want this house. Um, Jeff says, I'm not a fan of escalation clauses. Hey, I'm a fan of whatever gets the buyer the home, right? It, it, it has to be worded tactfully. You have to know the situ situation. And, you know, there's no harm in asking agents questions, you know, they're, they're, sometimes they'll tell you, sometimes they won't. You know, hey, what, what matters most to the seller? Do they want the highest possible price? Are they looking for a quick move? Do they want an extended closing period because they have to find a place to buy? Are they relocating? Just tell me. Please just tell me because then we're, we're, if you can be flexible in your terms, it's not always about price. Okay? So you see on the, the second one here, buyers and sellers agree to the following. Should a competing offer be submitted prior to the seller attorney approval, the buyer will increase their purchase price by 2600 See, they did 2600 because they thought somebody else might do 2000 See where this goes? Uh, above a competing offer to a maximum of 281 Boom. Counter for 281 Seller authorizes listing agent to provide complete signed competing contract, including proof of funds to buyer's agent and buyer's attorney prior to buyer attorney approval. Okay. There's so much legalese written in there. Like maybe I'm just going to counter that, right? Cause it's like, okay, maybe you felt that, um, there the seller felt cause that's what really matters. The seller has an offer for two, we we'll do this numbers properly, like two seventy eight six. I don't know what it is. And it's a cash offer. Maybe they have an offer for two. 70 and it's a cash offer and yours is more money 
but there's financing. Who's to say what's a best, the best offer is, you know, for me, I'd rather take a cash offer, no appraisal, no worrying about anything than something that's, you know, way more money, but it still has to appraise. Okay. Now let's look at the third option here. Whoops. This one here. Uh, in the event seller receives bona fide offer from another financially qualified buyer that is not contingent on the sale of a home and that exceeds 135000 uh, net of any seller concessions, then buyer agrees to increase the offer price of the agreement amount equal to the exactly $5,000 that the sellers will accept the offer instead of an offer from another buyer, agent with a copy of the bona fide competing offer and the related bank prequalification or pre-approval letter for the competing buyer's evidence proving the legitimacy of the... Are you kidding me? This person wanted to be an attorney when they grew up and they got into real estate, okay? Like, I would never write a, an escalation clause that long and that detailed. Simpler is better. You see at the top, escalation clause, buyer's offer will be 2000 over bona fide offer. Bona fide means that guy verify it, okay? In our market, and depending on where you are, uh, we're in an, an attorney state. So all of our, even though we write our own contracts, all of our contracts are verified or are they need to be approved by an attorney. So if it goes to the attorney, the attorney goes, hey, this is the other offer is not really a real offer, or whatever the case may be. It's not bona fide. Um, then we don't have to accept it. You got it? But the moral of the story is an escalation clause with no cap, depending on what your client's approved for, obviously you're not going to fraudulently write that in there. But I'll give you another example. Uh, I was writing an offer for a client. There was nine offers on this property. Uh, I had met with him beforehand. He was originally going to get financing, but instead he went to somebody he knew, not even a relative, a guy that he knew. He got cash money to buy this home. Okay. And his plan was to do a cash out refinance after he closed. So he's got cash. So that we're, we're, we're good there. He says, what do you think we should offer? I said, 5,000 over the highest bona fide offer. He goes, you think so? Yeah. Was what if what if it's I mean this property was, was like three hundred? He's like, what do you think if it goes to three twenty four? Well, no, okay. The attorney can still disapprove that contract, but then you will know how much it is. And it did go to like three twenty four, and he he says, well, what do you think we should do? Because the agent, a good agent's gonna call you and go, hey, this is what it is. Are you sure your buyer's wants to go that high? And I'm like, no. Let me ask him, but no. Uh, let, me, let me find out, but probably not. So I call him. He's like, nah. He's like, what do you think we should do? We went 295 and he got the home because he was competing with a financed offer, right? Somebody had to get a mortgage for 324. Okay. Makes sense. Uh, I know I wanted, I kind of killed the escalation clause a little bit. I went into greater detail maybe than you thought I would, but I think it's important because so many of you want to use them. And, and here's the other thing that can happen. I had a listing where we had, it was 17 offers, okay, 17 offers on this property. We, we have a spreadsheet that we use for multiple offers. If you want the spreadsheet, just send me a message and, and I'll get it to you. But, uh, so we had 17 offers. We then put in, okay, here's offer number one. Here's the price. Are they getting a mortgage? Yes. Are they getting inspection? Yes or no. And then anything else now, and then there was another tab that said escalation clause. I had multiple prop, multiple offers that had escalation clauses. So then I had to see, okay, this one had a cap. That one goes beyond that and figure that out. Uh, a listing agent might say to you, Hey, we're not accepting escalation clauses. Then it's like, right. You're at the most amount of money that your buyer's willing to pay. And you got to have that conversation. Like you had it in the beginning when you met with them, but it has to happen again when you write the offer. Like, oh my gosh, 10000 over asking, 20000 over asking. I don't know about that. And I'll, I use a relative story because I myself, there was this foreclosure that I purchased uh, in my younger days. I wanted this house. Ever since I was a kid, I wanted this house. I would, this house on the hill, this Queen Anne Victorian. There was a bunch of offers. I went 10000 over asking. Okay? I got the house. I never once thought, Oh man, I paid 10,000 over asking. What I thought was I was happy every single day when I pulled in the driveway. And when you think about your mortgage, my more, you know, it's another 50 bucks a month, roughly, right? $5 per thousand more or less uh, that you finance. So when you break it down the, to the ridiculous and say, look at 10 grand is 50 bucks, 
20 grand, 100 bucks. 30 grand, 150 bucks. Okay, so you can't get a good deal on a house that you never get an offer accepted on. And sometimes you will not get a second bite at the apple, right? When you get highest and best, when you have that deadline, that's not a time for you to try it. And then if you don't get it with sour grapes, go back to the agent. Well, we're, we're going to raise our offer. We're going to raise our offer. It's not the time. It's not the time. All right. So Pamela says, send me the spreadsheet for multiple offers, please. And thank you, Pamela. I will, um, just send me a message here on, on the J man speaks page. And that way I can just reply to it. It'll be easier for me uh, because I can attach something there. Uh, Bushra Banley, you got any questions? Jeffrey, you got any question? Yeah, a subject to attorney review. That's it's what we contingent on attorney approval. I know you guys, it's, it's a little bit even less locked up. They agree to it, and then it goes to the attorneys to mess up. Not mess up. <laughs> Approve, right? And so that, that, that can be a dangerous period. I know there's other parts of the country that do not have attorney approval at all. They get something accepted. They're good. Okay. The last thing I want to talk about, because this happened uh, on a listing of mine this past week. An offer gets accepted. Thank you, Linda. Uh, offer gets accepted. The, um, I got to give Linda some love here. Um, offer gets accepted. And then the buyer, the buyer's agent is like dragging their feet. It was an investment property, and in our market, we have what's called the rent roll addendum where they have to put the, the verified rent amount. They have to put uh, whether the tenant's on a lease or not or on a month-to-month. -month. The, the seller has to fill that out, okay? And the seller was going to fill it out. However, the buyer's agent, after the offer was accepted, got really confident in their position and was like, if you don't send us that, we're not going to be sending the attorney approval. And I was like... Oh, okay. Um, it's up to you, but if you're not going to send the attorney approval, then the seller's attorney is not going to send the approval. Weekend goes by. We have it in, in our, a classification called uh, under contract continue to show, right? So I'm letting people know there is an offer, but you could still show it because I don't have attorney approvals. Two people show it. Two people write offers, okay? The offer, one offer comes in on a Monday. And being the nice agent that I am, I still went back to the first agent and said, hey, uh, you get first right of refusal. The other offer is more than yours. Are you willing to come up? They said no. Okay, great. We take the second offer. Now, that third offer that came in, the second offer was they are very confident because they were like, oh, yeah, we bumped the other offer. I'm a champion. Well, the third offer then comes in higher than that second offer. Because that second person, again, was dragging their feet on the attorney approval. And, oh, they had planned to get an inspection, which they said uh, was like seven days out. It's way too long of, of a time frame. You need to find in, uh, inspectors that will do inspections for you a lot sooner. Um, and I get that they're, well, they're not as backed up as they used to be because so many people are waiving inspections. So have a handful, like six inspectors that you can call and see who can, who can get you in there first. But then the third person was the one... Um, they, they came in the highest. <laughs> the agent said to me, I'm like, okay, we're going to accept your offer. We're, we're the attorneys disapproving the second one that was accepted. And they're like, oh, I'm sorry for them. All's fair in love and real estate. I'm like, damn, so heartless. I couldn't believe it. Uh, but they got it. But they got it. Okay. Uh, and the last thing that I'll say before we kind of sign off here is... Uh, the inspection is not a time for you to renegotiate either, right? You had to have that conversation. If you do manage to get something accepted with an inspection, that is not the time for you to try to renegotiate your position or ask for a huge credit. I tell the buyers, like, look at, we're looking for latent defects. If there's a structural issue, if there's radon, if there's mold, if there's anything like that, that's what we're looking for. And then maybe, maybe they'll be willing to, to work with us, but probably not. Because they had all these other offers. We're not in a good position. Okay? You're doing this almost for your own information so you know what you're getting yourself into. Okay? So that's it. If you got any other questions, uh, I would love to answer them because it is Ask the Experts Anything Meaningful Friday, A-Team Friday. And while you're doing that, let me see if I can get the A-Team beats out here. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you.
Okay, so we got something from Eileen. Hey, Eileen, how are you? Uh, years ago, DOS advised that they were not bona fide offers as such. Agents were not required to present them. Um, if you look at license regulations, an offer consists of price, financing, et cetera. Of course, imagine what your client would say if you didn't disclose an offer much higher than the accepted offer. Yeah, so uh, the Code of Ethics most recently updated which I just taught an ethics class like a, a week or two ago, we still have to present all offers. All offers, regardless of whether you feel that it's bona fide or not, you don't want to get yourself, just like you said, Eileen, like uh, imagine you didn't disclose that an offer is much higher. Everything's going to the seller. I let them decide, and I'm not an attorney, and I don't practice law, nor will I do that on TV, in person, or on the radio. Um, so anything that comes in, it goes right right to the seller. Let, let them decide. All the way until... Look at I heard of a of a of a of a transaction it was for five hundred thousand. It was in the in the Queens Queens area, I believe, and an offer was presented for one hundred thousand dollars over asking. Okay, it was a week before closing. Everything else was done. That offer still has to get presented. Okay, that offer was presented. The seller took it. And you're saying, they can't do that. They could get sued. It's $100,000. They can hire an attorney to defend themselves. What they ended up doing was giving the buyer, who was very annoyed and frustrated and pissed off, $10,000. Here's $10,000 to make the blues go away. See you later. Took the other offer. Still netted another ninety grand. Okay? It's not up for us to decide. Let the attorneys, let, the, let our, our clients decide. Okay, uh, so that's it. If you guys have any other topics you want to talk about next week, because we plan this a week ahead of time, uh, Multiple Offers is so hot. And uh, if you didn't get a chance to see, uh, we did our, where is it? We did our, our, last week we talked about how to do your market update. Uh, if you go to our, our personal profile, you could see the video that we did talking about the market in our area because it's not just talking about the market, but then it's also explaining it to buyers and sellers and what it means to them. Let's see. But you could also check out our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash jmanspeaks. Teresa, you're welcome. Everybody else, you're welcome, you're welcome, you're welcome. This is Jeremiah's J-Man Monero with J-Man Speaks with Ask the Experts Anything Friday. Have a great weekend, sell lots of real estate, and be safe out there. Thank you very much.